Christianity is the world's great curse. The one great corruption, the immortal blemish of mankind. My name is Frederick Nietzsche. You don't know me. You know some of my ideas and some of my products. Hitler and Goering, Hess and Himmler were all mine. I taught them that God is dead. There is no longer any God, any sinner. Free will and moral order are the most malignant counterfeits that exist. They're all lies. The important thing is the will to power, to transcend oneself, to make oneself a God. Remember the name. Insight, the religious principles underlying American democracy, the fundamental connection between faith and freedom. No, your television set is working. So are Mr. Nietzsche's vocal cords, perfectly. But for the moment, Mr. Nietzsche has said quite enough. My name is Father Kaiser. This is the 20th century. Frederick Nietzsche has been dead for more than 60 years. What he said is really not very new. It's merely an extension of what began when the first dictator planted the first ripping boot and strap upon the pages of history. Since the beginning of time, every strong, Hansel be meddled symbol of giant authority in every super state that has housed every superman has been telling the world that God is dead, the truth is an enemy, and logic a menace. Sure, there have been refinements throughout the century, technological advances, sophisticated approaches to the destruction of human freedom, stockpiles of propaganda weapons that enslave people, but convince no one. Armor that captures countries, but not minds. But in every case, the tyranny has been short-lived. Because man has a mind, he's conscious of his own dignity. He can understand the world around him, and he can conclude that there must be a god. I have 10 coins here. They're marked from one to 10. And I put them in the glass. And I want to pull them out of the glass in order. My chances of first pulling out number one is one in 10. Of pulling out one and two in succession is one in 100. My chances of pulling out one, two, and three in that order is one in 1,000. And the odds against my drawing out one to 10 in that order are one in 10 billion. These odds are a mathematical certainty. So also are the odds against your and my being a product of the blind forces of the universe. With the same measured certainty that we see the practical impossibility of drawing the 10 coins from the glass in order, we see the absolute impossibility that we are the result of a cosmic accident. Some mind must have designed us. Our Earth turns on its axis at a speed of 1,000 miles an hour at the equator. This gives us a 24-hour day. If it rotated at 100 miles an hour, our days and nights would be 10 times as long. The uninterrupted rays of the sun would blister all vegetation, and in that 240-hour night, temperatures would drop so that all life would be frozen out. The sun is the source of the Earth's energy. It has a surface temperature of 10,000 degrees. The distance between Sun and Earth is 93 million miles, close enough to warm us, but not too close. If the Sun gave off only half its present radiation, the cold would be more than we could bear. If it gave half as much more, the heat would kill us. The Earth is tilted at a 23 degree angle. This tilt gives us the four seasons. Without it, vapors from the ocean would move north and south, piling up great continents of ice. The Earth would be uninhabitable. The moon is 238,000 miles from the Earth. If it was much closer, twice a day, the ocean tides would be so enormous that all our continents would be submerged. Even the great mountain ranges would erode away. The Earth has a circumference of 25,000 miles. If it was much larger, the force of gravity would impale all of us to its surface and make movement impossible. If the Earth were smaller, we would be so light 
that we would sail out into space. If the Earth's crust was much thicker, there would be no oxygen we couldn't breathe. If the ocean was much deeper, all carbon dioxide would be absorbed and there could be no life of any kind on this planet. Earth, moon and sun, and their direct relationship to you and me, and the very direct and obvious certainty that none of this is an accident. There is not one chance in a billion billion that life on this planet is the result of chance. Some mind must have been behind it. We usually call that mind God. Isaac Newton, the father of modern physics, puts it this way. He says, a whole variety of created things could arise only from the design and the will of a being existing of himself. In other words, de design demands a designer. The order of the universe requires someone to do the ordering. The laws which govern the universe had to be made by somebody. The scientists discover these laws, but they don't make them. Only God can do that. Whitaker Chambers was a convinced and dedicated communist, actively engaged in espionage for the Soviet Union. In his book, Witness, he describes for us what happened one morning as he watched his daughter eat her breakfast. My daughter was in her high chair. and I was watching her eat. She was the most uh, well, miraculous thing that ever happened in my life. I, I like to watch her even when she uh, smeared porridge on her face or <laughs> even dropped it uh, meditatively, you know, on the floor. Then uh, my eye uh, came to rest on the uh, delicate convolutions of her uh, ear. Those intricate, perfect ears. And the uh, thought passed through my mind that no, those ears were not created by any chance coming together of uh, atoms in nature. <laughs> See, that, of course, is the communist view. They could have been created only by I Im immense design. Well, the thought was uh, involuntary and unwanted. If I'd completed it, I should have had to say, design presupposes God. I did not know then that at that moment, the finger of God was first laid upon my forehead. Years later, this experience took Whitaker Chambers out of the Communist Party, and the religious conviction that grew from it caused him to risk his life and career to expose the Communist espionage rings in the United States. And it all started with his daughter's ear. Whitaker Chambers' experience is not an uncommon one. In different ways, in different tones, the visible world speaks to us of its invisible creator. The crashing oceans tell me of God's power. The starry heavens reveal his infinite wisdom. The snow-capped mountains bespeak his beauty and majesty. And the ear of a little girl shows God's tremendous love for each of his creatures. Whichever way we turn, to the colossal cosmos with its harmony and order, to the human body with its intricate design, or to the human spirit with its mysterious aspirations, we are led to the same conclusion. This world has been created by some supreme intelligence. A loving God has called it into existence. The fact that God can know and love means that he's personal. But he's not a person as we are persons, for he possesses personality in a unique and special way. He's free of the imperfections which encumber our personalities. When I say that God is personal now, I don't mean that he's an old man with a long white beard that delights in patting little boys on the head and giving them sticks of candy, a sort of spiritual Santa Claus. Nor do I mean that he's a stern old tyrant whose darting eyes are ever anxious to find some excuse to send his creatures to hell. Now, when I say that God is personal, I mean that he's a separate and distinct being who can know and love. I mean he's a pure spirit. He has no body. He cannot be pictured or imagined. He certainly doesn't have a long white beard, and his eyes are not darting. Throughout man's long history, the overwhelming majority of the human race have accepted the existence of a personal God. 98% of the American people at the present time believe in his existence. They do so for different reasons. I'm Otis Carney. I recently wrote Good Friday, 1963. As a novelist, I'm concerned mainly with people. Why do they do the things they do? Why do they ask so many questions about everything? 
Why does man have an almost compulsive need to love and be loved? The more I learn about people, the more convinced I am that there is a God. Only God can give meaning and purpose to human existence. Only God can answer man's questions and satisfy man's needs to be loved. People wouldn't make any sense at all to me if there were no God. In fact, I couldn't work or exist if I didn't believe in God. How do you do? I'm Catherine Grant Crosby. I'm an actress and the mother of three children. Well, first I'm the mother of three children and then in my spare time I'm an actress. Um, I don't have to be a logician and heaven knows I'm not to know that there's a God. I find him all around me. Where? God's easy to find on the surf when you're walking in the water and the sun sets there and you breathe in the tangy air. He's there. Or perhaps if you climb a hill and you get to the top and you look down through the clouds and there's the valley below. God isn't hard to find. He's here and there and everywhere. We have only to open our eyes. And if we open our hearts and begin to love, then we will find him in the most important place of all, within ourselves. Hi, I'm Bob Newhart. I'm a comedian, and I've been asked to explain why I believe in the existence of God. I derive most of my humor from the disorders of the human race, from human frailty. But human frailties presuppose perfection, and disorder presupposes order. There has to be a source of all order and all perfection, and this to me is God. I've been asked to explain, to describe, the woman who sits next to me, the mythical woman and the driving instructor. I've never been able quite to describe her in words, and I find it even more difficult to try to describe God. He's everything. He's beyond words. This, to me, is God. I am Dr. Eric Ewell. I'm a neurosurgeon, which means that I specialize in that most intricate part of our anatomy, the human brain. Here is a plastic model of that complex organ. It controls man's every action, it originates man's every reaction. Apart from size, however, the human brain and the brain of an ape are physically almost identical. The major difference is in function. This function is the ability to think. This makes man a rational human being. This synthesis of thought differentiates man from all other animals. All attempts to reproduce thought experimentally have failed. Could then this unique function be the product of a chance atomic collision occurring billions of years ago somewhere in the universe? I think not. Only a supreme intellect can be the explanation. Only God can explain the human brain. My name is Francis Whelan. I am United States Attorney for Southern California. As such, I am concerned with right and wrong. I find that the roots of all law are in the conscience of man. Intuitively, we all know that certain things are right and others wrong. My conscience tells me to do certain things and refrain from others. No one else need tell me. I have often asked myself, where does this sense of duty come from? Where does this cornerstone of all of our laws, this innate sense of right and wrong, originate? For me, there is one answer. God is the author of the moral law. He put into the heart of man the innate sense of right and wrong. Our civil laws are expressions and extensions of this divine law. They do not create it. My name is Morris West. I'm a novelist and a playwright. I'm the author of a book called The Devil's Advocate. In a sense, I am the devil's advocate in that 
I try to explore from the point of view of belief the dilemmas and confusions of those both who do believe and those who do not. I believe in God because A, I am induced to belief by reason. I am not brought to belief by reason. Unaided human reason can show me the possibility of a reasoning creative being at the back of the universe. It can give me a deductive summary of some of his attributes. Beyond that, it tells me nothing. It leaves me in total confusion about his nature or my relationship to him. Those of us who have a gift of believing have a duty to those who still live in confusion. And it is a duty not to despise the confusion, but to have compassion for it and to attempt to share that greater or large piece of illumination which we have with those who don't have it. There are, however, three types of persons who have difficulty accepting the existence of God. First, there is the practical atheist. He does not deny God's existence. He may, in fact, even observe the outward practices of religion. But in practice, he excludes God from his daily life. He's like Mr. World. Mr. World went to church. He never missed a Sunday. Mr. World went to hell for what he did on Monday. Practical atheism locks God into an airtight compartment from which he is allowed to emerge only on Sunday mornings. It excludes God from the general organization of life. With no God to give meaning to his life, the practical atheist is forced to raise up idols for himself. And so he begins to live for comfort, or money, or prestige, or for his own ego. These receive the worship of the practical atheist. I think practical atheism is the worst kind, because it causes the other kinds of atheism. I'm very sure that God would rather be hated than ignored. The second type who has difficulty accepting the existence of God is the pseudo-atheist. He rejects the false gods of the practical atheist. He can't stomach the smugness and hypocrisy of the practical atheist. And in rejecting these gods, he calls himself an atheist. But the gods he rejects are not the true God at all. And this is why he is called a pseudo-atheist. There is a good chance he is not an atheist at all. He may well acknowledge a transcendent source of life an absolute basis for truth, beauty, and goodness. In reality, he possibly worships the true God with his life. He merely gives him another name. St. Augustine is referring to practical and pseudo-atheists when he says, there are many outside the church who appear to be inside, and many inside who appear to be outside. There are atheists who profess to believe in God, and there are believers who carry the label atheist. The third type is the absolute atheist. He rejects the very existence of the God in whom the believer believes. Marx and Lenin were absolute atheists, although I suspect they have now changed their minds. John Paul Sartre would seem to be a contemporary one. The fundamental premise of the absolute atheist is the non-existence of God. He can hold such a premise only by doing violence to his own nature. The bird acts as a bird when it flies through the air. A fish is a fish only when it's immersed in water. The human eye is enabled to function as an eye, only when it's bathed in light. And the human mind is at home, it is able to operate naturally, only in a universe which constantly speaks of its creator. The absolute atheist must bar from consciousness the consistent testimony of the world around him. This is quite an effort, and it puts the absolute atheist at war with himself. He must fight the natural inclination of his own nature, he must constantly try to suppress the tendency within himself toward truth, beauty, and absolute goodness. There's no rest for the wicked or for the absolute atheist. He is compelled to be militant. He must constantly speak of his atheism to others. Why does he do this? Either to get attention he can get in no other way or to reassure himself that he is right. He's plagued by doubts. He's tormented by the inclinations of his own nature. I have never known an absolute atheist who was content with this atheism. An absolute atheist is a man at war with himself. He can continue to be an atheist only by ceasing to be fully human. <laughs> what does he know about atheism? Poor fellow, he believes in God. <laughs> oh, I admire religious faith. You might even say I was pious. Yes, I was pious. I said my prayers, I went to church. After all, my father was a minister. Many people came to hear him preach. They never put it into practice.
Yeah, they're all hypocrites. Pious phonies, that's all. Religious people are all the same. The last Christian died upon the cross. When I went to the university, I threw the whole thing over. I just couldn't take it any longer. And so I rebelled against my parents, against the way the world was being run, and against God. I couldn't stand the thought of him. But God is dead. I killed him. When I finished the university, I devoted most of my time writing. What did I live for? Myself, of course. If there is no God, then we are all gods. I am God. I am the important one. My ego is the center about which all else must revolve. I wrote a book about myself. <laughs> Listen to the chapter titles. It'll give you an idea how I feel about myself. First, why I am so wise. Second, why I am so clever. Third, why I write such good books. Fourth, why I am a destiny. Transcend yourself, that's the thing. Become a human, superhuman. That's what is important. I have done it. I have passed beyond good and evil. Morality is for those who can make the grade, not for me. After all, if there is no God, anything is permissible. I don't know why I'm talking to you. I don't like people. I can't stand them. I don't believe in love. Why should I? I am the important one, not they. I despise the man of today. His foul breath chokes me. Oh, it all seems so futile. I'm always fighting, but for what? Life has no purpose. It's senseless. I can go on. I can go on. God is dead. I killed him. Frederick Nietzsche was a man destroyed by his own ideas. I wish I could tell you that his ideas died with him. But I cannot. His books became very popular in the first part of the 20th century. They were carefully studied by a group of German politicians who later were to be called Nazis. When Hitler seized power in 1932, the writings of Friedrich Nietzsche became the Bible of the Third Reich. The policies of the Nazi government were dictated by his principles. You and I had the terrible misfortune of watching these principles being put into practice by a powerful government. Nietzsche said that God was dead. Hitler persecuted all forms of religion. Nietzsche extolled the will to power. Hitler practiced it. Nietzsche spoke of supermen. Hitler told the Germans that they were the master race. Nietzsche mocked morality. Hitler used any means to achieve his goals. Nietzsche scorned pity. Hitler exterminated millions of people. Nietzsche took his life. Hitler ended his in a flaming bunker in Berlin. Nietzsche's atheism was practiced by Hitler. It ravaged Europe. It destroyed more than 50 million people. The world today is attacked by another form of atheism. Communism is not derived from Nietzsche. It is derived from Karl Marx. But in essence, Nazism and communism are the same. They are both atheistic philosophies which seek to destroy freedom and human dignity. The communists are militant, they are intelligent, they are dedicated to the triumph of their atheistic philosophy. Already they control one third of the Earth's surface and they apply constant pressure to the remainder. They have set their minds on controlling the whole world. 
here in the united states we are equipped to fight this battle in the military and economic level but basically this is a war of ideas a life and death battle between two face the cold war will be won or it will be lost in the world of the spirit and it's here in the world of the spirit that unfortunately we sometimes seem to be weakest this country was established on a religious basis all the founding fathers were deeply religious men thomas jefferson wrote to the faith of the founding fathers we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness but in recent years something has happened the religious convictions of the american people seem to be draining away and many Americans have slipped into practical atheism. They don't deny the existence of God, but they choose rather to ignore him. They live their lives as if he did not exist. Practical atheism could lose us the Cold War. It can give us neither the strength nor the wisdom we need to counter the communist thrust. The complacent suburbanite in the gray flannel suit, dedicated to his own comfort, is no match for the committed commissar with a black and white mind and the blueprint for world domination. Communism is a big idea, and you fight a big idea with a bigger one. God is our American heritage. In God we trust, or at least we did at one perilous time in our history, and the peril is no less today than it was when we were founded. Twenty-five years ago, Adolf Hitler stampeded a nation into a suicidal war. Today, one dynamic, dedicated, pathological personality could press a button that would destroy civilization as we know it. What do we do about it? We rededicate ourselves as a Christian nation. We restore truth and love to the very center of our lives. We carry God into every aspect of our national life, into our stores and shops and factories, into our classrooms and libraries and television studios, into our homes and town meetings and legislative chambers. In God, we do indeed trust. Not so far-fetched, not so impractical, not so impotent as some would have us think. Think about it, and think about him. Make him the center of your life. Make him the center of the nation's life. Then as a nation we will be strong, and each of us will know the joy of living in the friendship of God. Insight is a production of the Paulist Fathers, a group of Catholic priests who serve their nation as witnesses to the religious truth which underlies American freedom.